Hello, my name is Chelsea Ferlin and I am the MICU dietitian. Today I will be discussing the importance of nutrition in the ICU, the role of a dietitian in the ICU, and how malnutrition affects critical illness and patient outcomes. I'm going to start by talking about malnutrition and the inflammatory process, which we see a lot of in the medical ICU. Critical illness is associated with a catabolic stress state, which leads to breakdown of protein reserves, movement of protein to the extravascular spaces, and leads to an increased risk of malnutrition or worsens existing malnutrition. During this period of increased metabolism, amino acids are taken from skeletal muscle for gluconeogenesis, and surprisingly, one gram of excreted urinary urea nitrogen is equivalent to about 30 grams of lean tissue, and therefore patients can lose up to three kilograms per week of lean body mass if kept NPO. This is unfortunately a common occurrence and or a medical necessity to leave patients NPO, which can ultimately lead to malnutrition. Albumin, prealbumin, and transferrin are not reliable markers of nutritional status in the ICU as they are negative acute phase reactants and the majority of patients in the ICU will have elevated CRPs or estimated sedimentation rates due to their hypercatabolic state and inflammation. These markers are therefore not used to diagnose malnutrition in any capacity. Instead, dietitians will determine malnutrition by obtaining a nutrition history, analyzing weight changes, and conducting a physical exam. Questions we might ask the patient include how the patient was eating prior to admission, if they have noticed any weight changes, and examine for fat and muscle wasting. If we cannot speak to the patient, if they're intubated or sedated, we will try to speak with family members who can provide an accurate history, call nursing homes, or at the very least perform a physical exam. Dietitians can diagnose malnutrition with the sole criteria of both fat and muscle wasting, so all we would need to diagnose malnutrition is a physical exam. BMI is actually not a criteria for diagnosing malnutrition, as you can be overweight and still be malnourished, or on the other side, be underweight and not be malnourished. So for example, a patient with a BMI of 35 may have lost 30 pounds in the last month due to critical illness and decreased appetite and therefore be diagnosed with malnutrition. And on the other end of the spectrum, you can have a patient who has a BMI of 17 who is naturally thin with a great appetite and very stable weights prior to admission and therefore not be malnourished. This next slide provides an example of what dietitians look for when performing a physical exam. In the picture on the left, you can see obvious fat and muscle wasting in the tricep, clavicle, and deltoid regions. And on the picture on the right, you can see wasting in the temporal region, in the orbital regions, pretty much all over the face that the man is very malnourished looking. So this is what we look for as dietitians when we do our physical exam. There are three types of malnutrition that we diagnose, the first being starvation, social or environmental related malnutrition. This can be a patient with anorexia nervosa who comes in and we diagnose them as, malnutrition, as malnourished, or maybe a single elderly patient that is homebound and has limited access to food. The next type of malnutrition is a chronic disease related malnutrition and this can be anything from a patient that comes in with cancer with a lot of weight loss and no appetite to a patient with end-stage liver disease. I like to use the example of the end-stage liver disease because they have you know, this big ascites belly, they have extreme wasting on their extremities, they just can't eat anything because they feel so full with their ascites. So this would be a classic example of somebody with chronic disease-related malnutrition. The last type of malnutrition is the acute disease or injury-related malnutrition, which is caused by major infections like sepsis, burns, traumas, even closed head injuries. This is the type of malnutrition which is commonly caused by not providing adequate nutrition to patients in a hypercatabolic or critically ill state in the intensive care unit. Malnutrition in the ICU is associated with an increased risk of severe events, including more likely to develop pressure ulcers, surgical site infections, intravascular site infections, and caudies. As many as 40% of patients may suffer from malnutrition and has been found to impair immune function, impair ventilatory drive, 
increased risk of infectious morbidity and mortality, increased length of stay, and is associated with higher healthcare costs. Diagnosing malnutrition can increase reimbursement rates for the hospital, and it is important to have accurate documentation when charting. Both the dietitian and the physician's note should be consistent in a malnutrition diagnosis. So if I, as a dietitian in the MICU, decide that somebody is malnourished and I document that in my note, I would then therefore tell the physicians that I think that they're malnourished, and then they can hopefully put that in their note if they agree. And likewise, if the physician thinks that somebody is malnourished, they would then let me know and I can confirm that in my note. Malnutrition in the ICU is associated with an increased risk of severe events, including more likely to develop pressure ulcers, surgical site infections, intravascular site infections, and caudies. As many as 40% of critically ill patients may suffer from malnutrition and has been found to impair immune function, impair ventilatory drive, increase risk of infectious morbidity and mortality, increase length of stay, and is associated with higher health care costs. Diagnosing malnutrition can increase reimbursement rates for the hospital, and it is important to have accu accurate documentation when charting. Both the dietitian and the physician's notes should be consistent in a malnutrition diagnosis. So if I think a patient is malnourished and I put it in my note, I would then tell the physician that I think that they're malnourished and they should document accordingly if they agree. And likewise, if the physician finds that a patient is malnourished, they would then let me know or I will confirm that in my note. So how do we prevent malnutrition in a critically ill intubated patient who is NPO? Placing enteral access early, which is defined as the first 48 hours from admission, can reduce disease severity, decrease length of stay, and favorably impact patient outcomes. This can be as simple as placing an OG or NG tube upon intubation and beginning tube feeds as soon as medically able. Early enteral nutrition promotes protein synthesis, acts as a stress ulcer prophylaxis, maintains gut integrity, lowers the risk of infection by stimulating GI blood flow and maintains tight junctions between cells, and reduces hospital length of stay and overall all mortality. One of the major concerns for initiating early enteral nutrition is gut ischemia. This is a very rare occurrence. It occurs in approximately less than 1% of patients. However, it is still feared in the ICU setting. Per ASPEN guidelines, which is the American Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition, the use of stable vasopressors should not preclude a trial of enteral nutrition. Guidelines discourage early enteral nutrition in critically ill patients who are both hemodynamically unstable and have not had their intravascular volumes fully resuscitated. Per ASPEN guidelines, enteral nutrition may be provided with caution to patients on stable low doses of vasopressors whose MAPs are greater than 50. In very unstable patients, enteral nutrition may not have a priority, and potential positive effects of enteral nutrition are unlikely to help improve stability. If a patient becomes hypotensive with MAPs below 50 and or have escalating doses of catecholamine agents required to maintain hemodynamic stability, enteral nutrition should be held. As soon as the patient becomes hemodynamically stable with intravascular volumes fully resuscitated and on stable pressor support, enteral nutrition may be resumed. Tolerance to enteral nutrition should be assessed by ensuring adequate stooling, assessing for abdominal distension, nausea or vomiting, and taking appropriate action, whether that be increasing bowel regimen, adding promotility agents, and possibly advancing an NG tube post-pylorically in the case of severe delayed gastric emptying. If the patient is experiencing diarrhea, the service should determine if it is infectious-related versus medication-related. Antibiotics, PPIs, prokinetics, NSAIDs, laxatives, sorbitol-containing medications can all lead to diarrhea, and attempts should be made to distinguish whether it's infectious diarrhea versus osmotic diarrhea. If it is osmotic diarrhea, then I, as the dietitian, can always adjust the tube feeding formula. Checking gastric residual volumes are no longer recommended per ASPEN guidelines and are reflected in the updated policy at Loyola. 
Several randomized control trials have shown that elevated gastric residual volumes have no correlation with incidences of pneumonia, regurgitation, or aspiration. Checking gastric residual volumes can lead to potential tube clogging, inappropriate cessation of enteral nutrition, and consumption of nursing time. Instead of checking gastric residual volumes, aspiration prevention should include daily oral care, reducing the level of sedation whenever possible, ensuring the head of bed is elevated at least 30 to 45 degrees, and considering post-pyloric tube feeds for patients who are at high risk for aspiration or for those who have had previous incidences of aspiration pneumonia. Although small bowel enteral nutrition decreases the risk of aspiration pneumonia, there is no difference in mortality or length of stay between small bowel and gastric tube feeds. This next slide explains how we as dietitians calculate nutritional needs for patients so you can have an idea where these estimations come from. We use weight-based calculations here at Loyola using the range of 25 to 30 calories per kilogram of actual body weight in the normal BMI range. It is recommended to hypocalorically feed the overweight and obese while providing elevated protein. So the range of 20 to 25 calories per kilogram of actual body weight is used for an overweight BMI between 25 and 29. The range of 11 to 14 calories per kilogram of actual body weight is used for a BMI of 30 to 50. And the range of 22 to 25 calories per kilogram of ideal body weight is used with a BMI over 50. And this just helps promote weight loss for the overweight and obese while preserving that lean muscle mass. There are many different tube feeding formulas on Loyola's formulary. The one I most commonly use in the MICU is Osmolite 1.5, which is a moderately fluid restricted formula, and the 1.5 just means 1.5 calories per milliliter. I use Osmolite 1.5 because most patients are somewhat fluid overloaded when they are admitted to the MICU or have a high risk of becoming fluid overloaded. If a patient is hypernatremic or needs more fluid, I will typically use Osmolite 1 cal, which is the least fluid restricted, with one calorie per milliliter. If a patient is severely fluid overloaded with a sodium less than 130, I tend to use something like a two cal HN, which is the most fluid restricted, with two calories per milliliter. The only reason I would use a specialty formula like Novasource Renal, which is obviously a renal formula, is if someone had persistent hyperkalemia or hyperphosphatemia related to their disease state or kidney function, this is lower in both potassium and phosphorus, and it is also a two calorie per milliliter formula, so very fluid restricted. And you'll see dialysis patients mostly getting Novasource Renal just because it is lower in potassium and phosphorus. And since we're trying to get fluid off of a dial dialysis patient, um, that's why it's very fluid restricted. Prostat and Beneprotein both add more protein to the tube feeds without adding a lot of calories. And so for example, Prostat provides 100 calories, but 15 grams of protein, which is really nice. And Beneprotein adds 25 calories and six grams of protein per packet. Nutrisource Fiber is a fiber supplement. Um, so it's three grams of fiber per packet. Um, generally, it's advised per Aspen guidelines to avoid the routine use of fiber in critically ill ICU patients who are at a high risk for bowel ischemia or severe dysmotility. Most of these critically ill patients experience some form of delayed gastric emptying and fiber would only add to the problem. So generally, we will start with something like an Osmolite 1.5 or an Osmolite 1 cal because these are both fiber free and will adjust as needed. If for some reason they're having diarrhea, their C. diff is negative, they're hemodynamically stable, that's when I'll start adding something like a Nutrisource fiber, maybe three packets per day for a total of nine grams of fiber to see if that'll help with their diarrhea. Parenteral nutrition is another form of nutrition support that is seen in the ICU setting. However, it has been shown to increase infection, length of stay, and total cost. Per Aspen guidelines, if tube feeds cannot get to goal by day seven, it is recommended to initiate supplemental TPN. And this just means that if tube feeds are attempted over the course of seven days and the patient is not tolerating them for any reason, they're stuck at maybe a trophic level of 10 mLs an hour, and their goal is 50 and they just can't get up to the rate of 50 within seven days, 
that's when we would start initiating supplemental TPN. And we just wait that long because it does increase the risk of complications. If a patient is at low nutritional risk, so they've been eating great before admission, they didn't have any weight loss, exclusive PN should be withheld for the first seven to 10 days following an ICU admission if they cannot begin tube feeds for any reason or if tube feeds are contraindicated. So for example, small bowel obstruction, ileus, things like that. If a patient is at nutritional risk, so for example, if they are found to be severely or moderately malnourished and EN is contraindicated, so they can't start tube feedings for any reason, it is recommended to begin TPN immediately. So again, this is for patients who have some sort of gut um, obstruction, their gut isn't working properly, they have an ileus, um, their NG tube is to suction and we can't feed them, that would be when we would start TPN immediately. Patients in the ICU who are able to take PO often are prescribed oral nutritional supplements because it is very hard for them to meet their elevated nutritional needs, especially protein needs, due to poor appetites. Glucerna, which is pictured all the way on the right, is used mostly for diabetics as it is lower in carbs. Um, it has about 220 calories and 10 grams of protein. Nepro, which is the second one from the left, is used for renal patients or with patients that have hyperkalemia or hyperphosphatemia, as this one is lower in potassium and phosphorus. And Nepro has 425 calories and 19 grams of protein. This one actually has the most calories and protein just because it is made for people on dialysis and those patients have very elevated calorie and protein needs. Ensure Plus, which is pictured on the left, is used for just the general patient who needs a little bit of extra calories and protein when they can't meet their needs orally. And this one has 350 calories and 13 grams of protein. We also carry Mighty Shake, which comes up frozen from the kitchen, and patients can let it sit out for 15 to 30 minutes to thaw, and then they eat it as ice cream. And this one has 300 calories and nine grams of protein, which is pretty comparable to an Ensure Plus. Ensure Clear is appropriate for patients on a clear liquid diet, as the clear liquid diet provides very little calories and barely any protein. And it is a useful supplement for those who don't like the creamy consistency of Ensure Plus. This comes in both mixed berry and apple juice flavors. And Ensure Clear provides 200 calories and seven grams of protein. EnsureClear and Mighty Shakes are also appropriate for people on dialysis because they are low in potassium and phosphorus. And if you ever feel like you want to try any of these supplements, feel free to ask for me. We can do a taste test if you want to. Thank you for listening. Hopefully this was helpful and shed some light on why nutrition is so important in the ICU. Feel free to call, page, or find me in the ICU with any questions you may have.